Splash, bang, wallop. Ooh, what a picture. What a photograph. I remember that song from a lovely film, sung, I think, by Tommy Steele. We are in the world of photography this week on Something Rhymes With Purple, the podcast all about words and language, the origin of words, the importance of language. And to make this possible, we have with us every week the world's leading lexicographer, in my view, She's very self-deprecating, she'd protest, but I don't know that there's anybody who knows more about words and language than she does. It's Susie Dent. <laughs> I like the way you said Dent, because uh, frequently my name is mangled in emails and you made a confession to me that you had done exactly that, hadn't you? I did. I what wrote... Did I, well, it's quite funny, I called you Susie Dett, D-E-B-T. <laughs> uh, I just uh, typing it quickly, Susie Dett. But that shows I realise how much I am in your debt. Oh. Uh, no, I've had worse. I've had Susie Dead before now. Uh, I must have had a cold that day when I was giving my name over the phone. If you're new to the podcast, essentially what happens is this. We get together once a week and we talk about words and language because we love words, we love language. And because Susie knows so much about the origins of words, she tells us when she knows, and if she doesn't know, she digs it out, about the etymology What's the origin actually of etymology? What does that mean? The etymology, etymology the etymology of etymology. It goes back to uh, the Greek for uh, word, essentially. So it is obviously, as you say, the word detection part. It's the study of the origin of words, but also, crucially, the way in which their meanings have changed throughout history. Uh, and if you go all the way back to the very first root of etymology, you will find that it goes back to the Greek for true, which I love because etymologists are essentially speaking the truth about a word. This is our 160th episode, which means you can go back over 159 episodes where we're talking about all sorts of things. We take a theme usually and use that theme as a kind of springboard for a conversation. Last week, I think our theme was time. This week, our theme is photography. You are a very reluctant <laughs> photographic subject, aren't you, Susie? Oh, my goodness. I'm the last person in the world, really, that should talk about photography because I avoid it at all costs. So it, it just show, shows on social media, really, because I love Twitter and really struggle with Instagram because it involves selfies, at least I think it does. And that's just so not me. I've always hated being photographed. I cannot look natural to a photographer's lens. I had to do a photo shoot the other day and it was absolute agony. So whereas some people I know would go and look at this such a rail of clothes that a stylist just brought and thinking, wow, I want to try all of these. I just, um, yeah, I, I basically just snuck or sneaked around the back of the of the screen and just thought, well, how on earth am I going to do this? And then just put on a rictus smile. Have you dug deep and tried to get to the origin of this? What's What's the source of this, Susie Dent? Why are you like this? I just don't like being above the radar, do I? I mean, that's just that's just me. I'm really I love doing what I do. I love talking about words and I can do that publicly. I don't have TV nerves anymore. But when it comes to focusing on me, that's a totally different kettle of fish. That's just not really where I feel comfortable. Well, it's very interesting because I think you take a lovely photograph, but all the pictures we've got of us together, and we've had to do yes. some occasionally formal pictures because we've worked together, um, you are always looking away from the camera. And, yes. and people laugh because you're usually looking at me <laughs> so as to have something to look at. Uh, but the way the picture comes out, it often looks quite quaint that you're sort of gazing at me. Um, I, Either I, gazing I at it, you or just, um, yes, sometimes I look Or looking at anywhere, phone. looking anywhere, casting your eyes. Um, well, I, I don't yeah, mind Yeah, I can't caress the camera with my eyes. I don't, I don't like that. Oh, do you support Surprise me, does he? Don't mind being photographed. <laughs> and I never have. I've always been quite happy to be photographed. And I've been photographed by some interesting people. And given that what you offer our podcast is etymology, and what I offer our podcast <laughs> is name dropping, yes. I shall drop a trio of names of people who have photographed me. I think the best photograph taken of me was taken by a woman called Jane Bowen, B O W N. Have you heard of her? No. She is a great photographer. Oh, dear. Uh, was the photographer for the Observer newspaper for many, many years. And she was famous. She used to turn up just with one camera, almost like a little box brownie, and she just took the picture and it was done. Mm -hmm. uh, and she took, well, oh, 40 years ago, a fabulous picture of me. She just turned up. I was standing at the bottom of some stairs. She stood at the top and it was over in five minutes. And that was wow. it. Wow, that's my kind been, of photographer, I have and to say. Gone. But often those instant pictures can work. You will have heard of Karsh of Ottawa. 
a famous yes. photographer in the 30s, 40s and 1950s. Yeah. Uh, I saw a wonderful exhibition of his photographs at Expo 66, 67. Anyway, it was a big international show in Ottawa. And he was on dis his photographs on display. They were extraordinary. But that famous photograph he took of Churchill, Winston Churchill, I think was taken during the war, towards the end of the war, looking so Churchillian and gruff at the camera. That was taken instantly. Churchill came down stairs at Downing Street. Kash of Ottawa was set up at the bottom of the stairs. And Kash of Ottawa took the cigar out of Winston Churchill's mouth. Winston Churchill growled at him and he took the picture. And so the picture of Churchill looking like the British bulldog stern, and uh, that is because he's had a cigar removed from his mouth a moment before. <laughs> so instant photograph taken to me by Jane Bone. She's one of my I'm, I'm just As you've been talking, I have Googled Jane Bone, Giles Bradford, and I can't find it. I can only find pictures of you in period costume uh, well, looking slightly um, gruff. You wouldn't uh, find it on my website because to reproduce a picture by Jane Bone would probably cost several thousand pounds. Oh, right, okay. So, but if you go to her archive, do look her up, J um, uh, B O W N, and you will see she's photographed everybody, and I think you will find the pictures very striking. Okay. Another photographer who has photographed me and who was a friend of mine was uh, the photographer uh, who began life as a theatre photographer, really, called Tony Armstrong Jones. He married Princess Margaret mm -hmm. and was made the Earl of Snowdon and therefore became known as Snowdon, photographs by Snowdon. And he again was a photographer where you could recognise a photograph by Snowdon across a crowded room. And he took some fabulous photographs, particularly theatre photographs from the 50s and 60s of people like Laurence Olivier. I know his uh, story from The Crown. I'm not sure how, how I'm not sure true how accurate that may that, be. That is, but yes. He, he, we Slightly could do bumpy. a whole... <laughs> I could do a whole programme with you. We might one day just get together and gossip about people. I could gossip a great deal about Tony Snowden. He was a very charming person, charming to have as a friend. I wouldn't go any closer than that because he could be that way madness lay. Okay. <laughs> but he was a genius photographer, no yeah. doubt at all. So I was lucky enough to be photographed by him. But again... I don't reproduce pictures by him because they cost thousands of pounds to have a picture by him. So if ever I want other people have pictures by Snowden, I've got some pictures of me with Snowden. So my pictures are with Snowden as well as by Snowden. And then I think probably the most famous, well, maybe not the most famous, uh, of the three I'm going to mention today was a lady called Eve Arnold. Eve Arnold was a photographer, an American photographer, who took famously photographs of Marilyn Monroe. Most of the best photographs of Marilyn Monroe were taken by Eve Arnold, and she became a friend of Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn Monroe trusted Eve Arnold, and so the pictures, she's she's relaxed and she's easy in the pictures, and they are, well, Marilyn Monroe was staggeringly beautiful. They are fabulous photographs. And I was lucky enough to go to school with um, Eve Arnold's son, and that's how I met her. So when I was a, a boy, she took some photographs of... of of me. So these are great photographers who I've been lucky enough to be snapped by over the years. Um, uh, but they are uh, well known photographers because they took pictures of rather more interesting and remarkable people than I. But nonetheless, it's exciting to have been photographed by the greats. Now, before we get to the origin of snap, let's get down to basics and etymology. A photograph, where does that word come from? Yes. Photography. Okay. So we have to go back to someone called Nicephore Nips. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but he was a French inventor and he achieved something very significant in photographic history in around 1826, 1827, when he permanently fixed the view of the courtyard of his house onto a pewter plate using bitumen. So using his process, essentially any plate could be produced and then etched and prints could be named from it. And so his fame rests not only on producing the first permanent photograph, but also on developing a way to um, reproduce it. And he originally called his method of capturing permanent images by the action of light on, I guess, chemically treated surfaces as heliography. And that means sun drawing. And then others came along and obviously wanted to improve the process. So there was a guy called Louis Daguerre who painted scenery for, you know, the Sans et Lumière entertainment in France. Yes. Is kind of, yeah, those are amazing 
firework displays, etc. I mean, much more than that. He regularly made use of a camera obscura, which we'll come to as well. And he, after loads of trial and error, he used, I think, common table salt to kind of fix an image, um, if you like. And eventually, after it's, lots and lots of different people had their hands in this, the term was coined photograph. And that was from the Greek photo, from, from phos, meaning light, and graphia, as in autobiography, uh, biography, uh, graphic, uh, which means writing. So it goes back to the Greek oh. for write. So it is writing with light, which I think is really quite beautiful. And uh, when they were coined, they immediately gained acceptance. As I say, I think there's something sort of slightly poetic and imaginative about them. And then it, it fixed. And the Victorians were really captivated by photography. And it's from Queen Victoria herself that we have the earliest mention of the abbreviation photo. Good grief. Yeah. So photograph comes in the early Victorian era or just before. Yes. Yes. And the word photograph is first used in, in Queen Victoria's diaries or in a letter by Queen Victoria, something like that, is it? The first abbreviate, the first use of photo. So oh, photograph wonderful. was used particularly in presentations to the Royal Society. So we're talking about 1820s, 1830s. And then Queen Victoria herself gave us photo. So we've had photographs for 200 years. And they were taken, a photograph was taken with a, a photographic device or was it called a camera from an early stage? So the camera, yeah, the word camera is actually very, very old. So the ancients, for example, knew that if light is allowed to filter through a tiny hole into a darkened room, you get images of outside objects and views. They're kind of reversed, aren't they? Sort of upside down on the wall. And so you could look at solar eclipses that way, for example. It was, gave you a really good way of tracing um, a projected object. And then a lens was added to this idea in the late 16th century, and that really sharpened the image. And a mirror was used to turn it the right way up. And of course, scaled down versions of these rooms then were produced. So they became kind of boxes, if you like. And a camera obscura meant a dark chamber, but actually it was mostly a box that reproduced this idea of the room where, uh, you know, the light had originally kind of filtered through. And then development of that into a photographic device began with the man that I mentioned, Nisifor Nieps, who placed a light sensitive plate inside and he produced the first photograph, as I say, of his courtyard from an upstairs window. And so the full phrase camera obscura was fully fixed in the language, and then by the middle of the century, you had camera. Simple as that. And eventually, I would you just get... say, Giles. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, go on. I didn't. Uh, well, I, camera is really interesting in terms of other members of the same family. So, as you say, it kind of goes back to the Latin for a vaulted chamber, and that actually was borrowed from the Greek, as so often, which meant an arched room, if you like. But it kind of spread into lots and lots of different ways. So, of course, in Old French, you have chambre, which is a room. Uh, you also have a comrade, which is somebody who shared the same room as you. Originally a camarade, so you can see the link with camera there. Gosh. And, yeah, and you have chum as well, which was originally a sort of chambermate. And oh, just lots and lots of different kind of ripples from that idea of a vaulted chamber. That's fantastic. So the chamber, mm. the room, chambre, your chamber mate, as it were, your camaraderie, it's all the same word. The, and yeah, all go back chamber, to that same chum. Oh, I yeah. think it's completely wonderful. It oh, is, I love language. It? It's fantastic. <laughs> so in, in these cameras, what do we put? We put, well, in the early days, there was a film was put once they're trying to fix it on a piece of film. Where does the word film come from? Well, film... Uh, is really old, but originally it meant a really fine membrane. So, for example, the membrane covering the eye or the brain or the stem of a plant, for, exa for example. And then during the 16th century, it was extended to describe any thin layer of anything. And then in the 19th century, it seemed a really good choice for the pioneers of photography because they applied it to the thin coating, the thin layer of light-sensitive emulsion that they spread on these photographic plates or, or paper. Very good. And the other details and things like negatives, all this is now ancient history. Well, except not. Um, I was visiting the University of Chester the other day because I'm the Chancellor of the University and I was going around the department where they teach film and photography and there they still have dark rooms where they they work with all this original material. Um, so they have film, negative, etc. Negative, 
It's, I suppose it's just the opposite of positive, isn't it? Yeah, it's That's just the I reverse, think. isn't it? It's just a photo that kind of shows the reverse of, of reality, if you like. And I, I was just thinking how, you know, dark rooms, there's something really romantic about those, I think, or just something that really appeals to the imagination, the sort of seeing of a photograph come to life slowly as the chemicals do their work. I do remember those Kodak instant cameras. I mean, gosh, I mean, they, I think those go back, well... George Eastman produced his first Kodak push-button camera, which had that whole roll of sensitive paper in 1888. That's how, how old that is. I know. I do um, remember. And you didn't, you couldn't risk opening the back and exposing the, the film to the light, and it all went wrong. Or it all scrubbled up, you know, um, when you tried to turn it. To, oh, I had such terrible times in the 1950s, 1960s. I did. Well, likewise get... with cassettes trying to record the top 20 on a Sunday evening and then and then oh. it getting stuck in the spool. Remember all of that? <laughs> <laughs> Nightmare. Um, but, yeah, so Kodak was the obviously proprietary name of a photo photography company. I'm not quite sure where it comes from. I'll have to look that up. But a Kodak moment was in a kind of occasion suitable for, you know, remembering it with a photograph. But nowadays on Instagram, et cetera, everything seems to be a Kodak moment. A picture, it's like a painting is a picture. But it's interesting, we, we talk about photographs being pictures pictures, um, not paintings. What is a picture? Where does that come from originally? Well, a picture, picture was originally a painting, um, so really old. It goes back to the Latin fingere, meaning to paint. Uh, and in oh, fact, that gave us oh. paint and it gave us pigment. And there's the saying, every picture tells a story, which, of course, applies very, very much to photography too. And the first to use that strap line was doned backache kidney pills that claim to cure everything from rheumatism to diabetes. And they used that as an advertising slogan. And then Charlotte Bronte had kind of anticipated this because that was in 1904. But in you know the mid-19th century, she was writing, the letter press I cared little for, each picture told a story. Um, but yeah, so a picture originally goes back to the idea of painting and uh, it's a lovely metaphor, I think, for taking photographs. I always refer to my pictures as snaps. Um, yeah. Why we call them snaps? I suppose because they happen quickly, instantly, but what's the origin of snap? Yeah, so snap is a sibling of snack and it's basically something that, as you say, is done with speed and um, that often makes a kind of quick, sharp, biting sound. So it's probably born for its sound. There's a German word, schnappen, to seize, which means very diff very similar things. So the idea of, yes, is just grasping or grabbing the moment and doing something very quickly, a snapshot. Yes, disparaging people talking about uh, Lord Snowden sometimes called him Lord Snapshot. He oh, did they? Didn't find that amusing. They don't like to be called <laughs> snappers, photographers. Understandably. No. Or paps. Um, I don't know whether pap is a. I don't yes. know. I what live it, in what it, that's paps. obviously an abbreviation of paparazzi or paparazzo. Mm. What is the origin yeah. of that and what is a pap? Well, a pap is, is a kind of celebrity photographer, a society photographer, I suppose they'd call themselves. So that goes back to the name of one such photographer in Fellini's film La Dolce Vita and uh, he was called Paparazzo so Paparazzi is actually the plural it's a bit like Panini and Panina it's the name of a character there was a character yes. called Paparazzo yes and there, it is a surname in Italy actually and so there have been various theories as to why Fellini actually chose that name himself. So according to, to him, the great film director, he said it was taken from an opera libretto. And he said that the word suggested a buzzing insect, hovering, darting, stinging, which I think is a brilliant, brilliant description of what a pap does. And there's also a name, uh, I think it's um, a story called By the Ionian Sea, which may have influenced it as well, because in the dialect of that book, it was a word for a clam. So maybe it was a metaphor for the kind of opening and closing of the camera lens. So lots of ingenious theories as to why Fellini chose it. But I love the idea of someone who's hovering and stinging. Uh, as I say, that seems to be, ring very true to me. You mentioned earlier how you loathed selfies. Mm. Um, what is the origin of selfie? How long has that been around as a word? Yeah, so, so well, if I asked you, do you have any idea when you think it might might have come about, a selfie? Quite comparatively recently. Is it a 21st century word? It is. Um, it was Oxford Dictionary's word of the year as well, I think in the last decade. But actually, the first reference we have of it is from an Australian forum post, which was 2002. And uh, someone just writes, sorry about the focus, referring to a photograph. It was a selfie. Yeah, so actually a little bit earlier than you might think, but still, as you say, 21st uh, century. And lots and lots of 
you know, vocabulary have emerged, I suppose, with the rise of Instagram and, and other social media, which rely on pictures. So photo bombing. Do you have ever photo bombed? Oh, constantly. Well, sometimes inadvertently, you know, you're yes. walking past, you look, and then suddenly you find you're there. People often do photobomb. I mean, the idea of photobombing is simply appearing in somebody else's photograph. They're trying to take a selfie and there you are poking your face in. Yes, exactly. 2008, that one. Oh, quite, quite recently. Um, there's a Japanese word, isn't there, for out of focus that some people use. Bokeh. Okay, I'm not completely sure how to pronounce that. But yes, so that's new for me, but given that I'm not actually a, a photographer. But I have heard of that word. Yeah, it's a kind of hazing. Uh, it's, it's an artistic or visual effect, so it's deliberate. And it's a hazing in the out-of-focus areas of a, of a photo, you know, as an aesthetic tool. Well, I, I think I managed to do bokeh work um, <laughs> inadvertently all the time. I'm not very good at it, I must say. Other people take such a good selfie. They, they just hold the camera out, click, and then everybody's in it. When I hold it out, you mostly photograph my thumb. My face seems to be very much bigger than everybody else's because I, I just can't get it right. I tell you what um, I find really depressing, and I remember the first time I witnessed this. So I was really lucky to go to... I was just, just a spectator, so I was kind of in the outer rows of the Pride of Britain Awards. I wasn't, I wasn't a kind of invited guest or anything. I was just... Um, part of the main audience and all I could see all around me was people holding up their mobile phones so I couldn't actually see what was going on on the stage holding up their mobile phones recording the entire ceremony rather than actually living it themselves they were just recording it I wonder if they were ever going to look back at this recording that they'd made but they completely missed the moment because they were so intent on looking through the lens of their camera rather than on the phone rather than and actually, you know, what was unfolding in front of their eyes, I found that really depressing. When I was writing a book about uh, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, one of the Queen's uh, queries said to me that he'd been with the Queen for many, many years, said the strangest thing that's happened over her time as Queen, in the old days, whenever the Queen appeared, people would applaud. And now it's always silent because they, ha they can't applaud because they are taking pictures of the moment. Yeah. So people, are, uh, the Queen has come to say hello, and instead of saying hello to the Queen, they're looking at the Queen. Through, yes, quite bizarre. You're right. It you is. Know. It's quite alienating, I think. Um, maybe that's because I'm just not a massive fan of, of photos. But, I mean, I love photos and I love the art of photography, but I just don't understand the idea of living through an experience at second hand all the time, second second hand remove. It's really And odd. also, where, where are we to store these photographs? I mean, I, I'm guilty of this. I'm, I'm taking pictures all day long, not just selfies. I, I see something amusing. You take pictures of um, your scrambled egg quite often. I, I, I do. I like to, I do that. In my <laughs> different breakfast, it makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting there. Well, Anyway, but the point is, what's going to happen? To, where are these going? I mean, what are, in the old days, you had a, my, my grandparents kept photo albums and they carefully, you know, once a year they would cut them out or put them in the album and it was a record of their lives. Now we're taking dozens of photographs every day. I know, what? and again, I find that it's funny. I've got one child who's... Childhood is chronicled absolutely in tons of photo albums. So she can actually physically sit down with those and look through them in the traditional way. And another child who has grown up entirely in the digital age, so all the photographs of her are on my computer. And it's not the same. It's not the same sitting at a computer screen and just looking at them, I think. So, yeah, I'm sounding very, um, anach well, not anachronistic, but very just <laughs> old You're sounding old, so Nostalgic. Old I'm sounding old. That's what I meant. I'm sounding old. Uh, but, yeah, uh, there's things that I don't like about it. Well, look, that's us in the world of photography. Let's uh, flashbang <laughs> one. One's wall. very comfortable, one's very uncomfortable. Yes, exactly. Maybe we should put out a picture of the pair of us. Too. You see, you look quite normal now. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a photograph. Now, you look, you see, you don't, I shouldn't have done it with, oh, look, she's looking charming. There we are. Hey. <laughs> I'm in my coat. I will take my coat off. I'm I will try. Here in my coat to keep warm. Uh, well, I'll try and take another <laughs> one. Now. Uh, look, she's hiding behind her mug now, everybody. I'll put these pictures out on the day we put this out. Okay. And uh, that's where we are on photos. But we are united in our response to your correspondence because we absolutely love it. We love hearing from you, genuinely. We do read absolutely everything, even if we can't answer every single one much as we would love to uh, but we do have a great voice note we've been getting voice notes in which actually mean the world to us because we actually get to hear you and we've had one come in from Lindsay Baumeister they have great great names our purple people Giles do you think they make them up just to make sure that we notice them probably do <laughs> Baumeister master of building 
Is that what it means? Baumeister? Yes, Baumeister. Baumeister, an architect oh. or something. Anyway, oh. Lindsay, let's hear from you. Hi. I play in an awesome online quiz where we choose from six emojis to select our clues. I've always said emojis as the plural, but on one of the quizzes, our American host said six emoji. I realised I didn't know whether I was right or they were. What is the actual plural for more than one of those adorable little pictures? Thank you, Lindsay Baumeister. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, where do you stand on emojis? Oh, I think they're great fun. I like an emoji. OK. You never sent me one. I would swear if I looked through our correspondence, you've never seen, never I'm, once sent uh, yes, me an emoji. But this is because my wife has told me to be very circumspect when I send communications, such as she says, don't do all the people you've never met before, Giles, are sending you emails <laughs> kisses. with kisses on. Yeah, She says, don't, just don't. Don't respond in kind. So I am quite cautious, which is interesting, isn't it? Is this to avoid and, litigation? Uh, well, yes, it's uh, well, it's to, uh, particularly if you actually haven't met the person, you don't know the yeah. person, you don't know how it'll be yeah. received. So um, my wife's advice to me is uh, on the side of discretion, Giles. Mm -hmm. uh, and also things can be, you know, I might inadvertently think, oh, well, let me send that person an aubergine. It's rather an amusing looking vegetable. Yes. And the next thing you know, uh, you're up in court. Uh, we have a lovely makeup artist in Countdown whose name I will not give out here, but she was on a certain dating site and was having a really lovely conversation with this guy who sounded really nice. And uh, he was just, they were just talking about what they were doing. And she said she was cooking and then sent five aubergine emojis without yeah. having a clue of their secondary import. Oh, so uh, nice. we'll have a nice laugh at her expense with her, I have to say. Well, what is the origin of the word emoji and what is the plural? Yes, yeah, sorry, Lindsay, we got carried away there. Well, it, it emerged in the 1990s and it's from Japanese, as you would have guessed, and where E is a picture and moji means a letter or a character. So is there an S at the end of it? Well, some house styles, and I want to talk about house styles, these are the kind of editorial policies of certain publishing houses, several newspapers, etc. cetera. Um, and certainly in the US, they take quite a hard stand on this. So they come out definitely in favour of emojis. So they are in favour of giving a word, even if it is a loan word from another language, an English plural. And so they put the S on. And so the New York Times followed suit. And I think even Emojipedia online, which is where you will find explanations of all your favourite emojis, they also put the S on. And emojis does kind of sound right, given that it's become quite naturalised in English now. However, if you want to remain true to the Japanese, uh, you should stick with just emoji, because in Japanese, they definitely would not put the S on. So as I say, English usually makes plurals using English plural rules rather than the rules of the loan language, but not always. And it's a very complicated uh, issue. I say emoji, but I think uh, most dictionaries would give you the option of either. Oh, you that say either sense. rather than, and you say either rather than <laughs> either. Let's call the whole thing before. off. I yes. think we've been here before. But yes, uh, the Oxford Dictionary, for example, says the plural same, emoji or emojis. So you can take your pick. OK. Yeah. Booby trap. This is going to be a fun one. Dear Susie and Giles, my son, Ed, eight, is very keen on pranks and often sets booby traps for his older brother, Harry, 11. He asked this morning, Why are they called booby traps? And I didn't have an answer. They both listened to the podcast with me in the car, so I thought you might know instead. Do you? Is it linked with the bird, for example, the red-footed booby? Or maybe the nickname for the mammary gland? Thanks. Graham. Ed and Harry. Oh, love that. Tell us all about the booby bird. Well, it is linked to the booby bird. So thank, thanks to Graham and Ed and Harry. Cause it's an absolutely brilliant question. So booby has been a nickname for a stupid person for quite a long time. Um, early 17th century, it began to emerge. So we're talking the 1600s here. And it probably goes back to the Spanish bobo and ultimately the Latin balbus, B-A-L-B-U-S, which meant stammering. So somebody who wasn't considered to be particularly clever. So slightly unkind right from the start. But a booby bird was a large tropical seabird. So it was of the gannet family and it had brown, black or white plumage, really brightly coloured feet. But it was well known for being slightly foolish. 
So here's a quote from 1634, and it is a travel journal uh, from a sailor. One of the sailors espying a bird fitly called a booby, he mounted to the top mast and took her, so unfortunately captured the bird. The foolish quality of which bird is to sit still, not valuing danger. In other words, the booby bird could easily be taken, and I guess eaten, by sailors on board a ship because they were not observant enough to be aware of the danger around them. And it's probably from that, the idea of someone who basically is a little bit clueless, including the poor booby bird, that we get the idea of a booby prize and of a booby trap. And a booby trap meaning someone who, a trap for someone who will walk straight into it without being particularly careful. Very good. Thank you very much for being in touch with us. If you have a, a query, a question, a point you want to make, it's simply a purple at something else dot com. Many people tune in because they want to improve their vocabulary. And you couldn't have a vocabulary that is greater or better informed than that of Susie Dent. Each week she gives us three words that she finds intriguing and that we'll enjoy. What are, What's your trio this week? Yes, intriguing definitely has the emphasis here because I'm not sure that any of my trio are going to be suitable for everyday use or, or useful, but I like them anyway. Uh, clipsome. So to be clipsome is quite an old label for meaning fit to be embraced. So if somebody is clipsome, you just want to give them a hug. I think that's mm, lovely. Like Not that. a clip yeah, around right. the ears, but a, a clasp. Clipsome. Clips yeah. them. And the next one is old dialect for a somersault. So what some of us would call a roly-poly, forward roll, or in old Cumberland dialect, poppin' noddles. A poppin' noddles, because your noddle was your head and your poppin' noddle is your kind of popping your head over that. in a somersault. So I just quite like that, a poppin' yes. noddles. And finally, this just takes me in my imagination to beautiful Venice. A barcarolle, B-A-R-C-A-R-O-L-E, a barcarolle is the song of a gondolier. Not going to be particularly useful for any of us, as I say, in, uh, in daily living, but I love it anyway. Oh, and Venice. I haven't been to Venice for years. It is. It's such a beautiful city. Could it be the world's most beautiful city? It's just amazing. My daughter went with her family to Venice at Easter which was a fantastic thing to do. And at Easter, my son and his wife and some friends got together for a poetry reading evening. And this is a fun thing to do. Have you ever done such a thing? No, I haven't. Some people find reading poetry tough. They think, mm. you know, it's not something they've done since school. But actually the way to do it, I think, if you, if you want to reintroduce yourself to the world of poetry, it's a fun idea to get two or three friends together, uh, uh, some supper, a bottle of wine, and each come along and read a poem uh, just and then talk about it uh, and it's it's quite a good way of of, of actually discovering uh, do you understand the poem do the other people understand the poem is it important if you understand the poem or not uh, the fun of poetry so i so recommend it's a book that club, a, but for poetry it's a poetry club yeah, exactly exa yeah. exact exactly that it's not as also it's not as heavy in terms of work as a book club you yes, just got to turn true. up with a poem to read and it's over and it can be a funny poem serious poem silly poem anyway our son uh, bennett and his wife, who's a, an actress, Kasha Engler, they and uh, a couple of friends of theirs who are actors who've been with the Royal Shakespeare Company most recently, they came and they read the poem by Shakespeare, Venus and Adonis, which I'd never, I have actually heard it read once before. The actor Michael Pennington did a performance of it and somebody played the lute while he read it and puppets acted out the story of Venus and Adonis. The point is, it was fascinating, really enjoyable and interesting and accessible. And what I discovered from my son, which I didn't know, is that this poem was the best-selling poem of the Elizabethan age. Indeed, the wow. best-selling book of the Elizabethan age. 10,000 copies sold. Isn't that amazing? Wow. People in Elizabethan times went out. Of course, there wasn't so much to do. And they bought copies of this and read it to one another. People wanted to have a copy of Venus and Adonis by William Shakespeare. Is that nice? That's beautiful. Yeah, right. Looking forward to this. You'll be pleased to know I'm not going to read it to you because it would take one hour and 22 minutes, which is <laughs> okay. the length of time it took them to read it to us. So they okay. got through the bottle of wine and the bits of pizza while they were reading. I'm going to read you a sonnet by Shakespeare, a well-known sonnet, Sonic 116. The reason is Shakespeare is in the air because we've just passed his anniversary. Uh, Shakespeare, we know, 
died on the 23rd of April, 1616, and we think he was born around the 23rd of April, 1564. So here is a poem that he wrote as a young man, sonnet, it's 116 in his sequence. Let me not, to the marriage of true minds, admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh, no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Oh, yeah. That is just breathtaking, isn't it? it it's good it's stuff. It's such a short life, just you reminding us of his birth and death dates, you know, just how much he achieved in those, what, 52 uh, years? I know, 50, 52 years. Extraordinary. Yeah. And I think for yeah. the last couple, he wasn't writing at all. Maybe he was just counting the money and trying to get back into Anne Hathaway's good books. That's what, what, that's what you've got to do, chaps, at the end of the life. Try to make it up to the wife if you can. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just throwing in a bit of philosophy at the end of the show. Is, is that it? Is that all we've got time for? Oh, the, if people like poetry, I ought to mention that we have this special thing. Purple Plus Club is the special thing, um, which will give you some bonus episodes on words and language. Um, and you can find out um, all about it in the um, regular programme description. So, yes, we'd love it if you could join us for those. And we are really grateful that you joined us for this. Uh, so thank you so much for your company. And um, please do get in touch. Keep getting in touch because we love hearing from you. Purple at something else.com. Something Rhymes with Purple, as always, is a Something Else production. It was produced by Lawrence Bassett and Harriet Wells with additional production from Chris Skinner, Jen Mystery, Jay Beale, Teddy Riley and the invisible man himself. I haven't seen him for a while, Charles. No, but he's clipsome when you do. It's Gully. <laughs> <laughs>